So let's talk about dance, Baroque dance, uh, ballet dance, modern dance. If you can define the difference between those three styles, just for our clarity, so to speak. Well, Baroque dance is dance of the 17th and 18th centuries. It um, was codified by Louis XIV in an Academy of Dancing in 1661. First time professional dancers appeared on stage in Europe and they danced something called the noble style, which had evolved out of a very idealistic sort of theatrical philosophy along with uh, social dancing, which was highly developed at that time. Uh, and by social dancing, you mean country dancing? Ballroom dancing, ballroom court, dancing. court dancing. Yes. Court dancing. Yes, yes, and very highly developed. They practiced daily. They were excellent dancers, the courtiers, and therefore, once the professionals began to evolve, they were an excellent audience of connoisseurs. So the, um, the style was subtle, courtly, uh, and it continued to develop, uh, never stopped. And um, the Commedia dell'arte actually had quite a bit of influence as it went on and brought in another character. There was the, what they called the grotesque style and the demi-character style, which were far more athletic. And uh, they slowly took over from the noble style as the world changed through the 18th century. By the early 19th century, ballet as we know it was beginning to evolve. And it hasn't changed all that much. And it's evolving through the athleticism that was yes, creeping in? Yes, because the noble style was much more subtle. Um, there was some athleticism, but it, wasn't, it was much more based on being elegant and stylish rather than being strong and athletic. See, people weren't dancing, people weren't studying social dancing just so that they would be able to dance in a ballroom. There was a real belief that disciplining the body, balancing the body literally, resulted in a balanced mind consequently balanced emotions, mm -hmm. that you became a rational person by training your body in a rational way. So this obsession with dancing with the aristocracy wasn't so that they could trip out a minuet in the ballroom, it's so that they could be becoming superior human beings in every possible respect. The 19th century, there's a whole different raison d'etre for why people are studying ballet. And, and the, the athleticism, why did that come in? Well, uh, the, the aristocracy uh, was dying out, the French Revolution was coming, and the middle class wasn't as sophisticated. They wanted something easier to appreciate, and physical effort makes sense to people that work for their living. Uh, elegance and style and refinement make more sense to people who watch this and uh, practice it wonderfully themselves and want to see, see it done with great style and flourish. You see, to appreciate the, the noble style of dancing that Jeanette is talking about, to a certain extent you had to be an initiate. You had to have studied that, and not studied just that, it was part of a lifestyle. It was a lifestyle that went together with a certain type of education. The same thing still happens now. We simply don't necessarily realize it happening because we're living in the world that we're living in now. But the political revolutions that swept through Europe in the late 18th and early 19th century, they didn't just change the political landscape, they changed the artistic landscape, the emotional landscape. It was the beginning of the Romantic Revolution. We're, working, we're moving from an Apollonian view of the world and moving into a more Dionysian view of the world. So the revolution, right, the athleticism, the I want to see a leap, I want to see Whatever. The a rise of the middle class. Or whatever it's going to be yeah. is partly I want to see something more spectacular. I want a bit more circus. I want yes. to see something I can understand. Yes. It's yeah. uh, the other day we were at a, a production of Kabuki Theatre. I mean, really, absolutely marvelous to look at. But I know perfectly well I can't truly appreciate Kabuki Theatre in terms of what it should be. I'm not an initiate. I can look at it and be amazed at certain at things that I'm looking at at certain aspects of the production. But put me beside someone who has been raised watching the kabuki their entire life, they're going to have a completely different appreciation. That's why the kabuki can be alive in Japan and it's not alive in North America or in Canada. I think the same sort of thing was happening. The aristocracy inhabited a certain world to a certain extent. So this, uh, this is a challenge, of course, for a modern day artist yeah. to present this in a way that makes sense to people today. And it's been, uh, I think it has been, can be successfully done. I think the audience that we have appreciates greatly seeing the elegance and refinement. Actually, actually I think it's quite uh, refreshing compared to some other things that they see on, on film and stage. 
I mean, we really feel that this, the, the world that we are in now is a world that longs for, uh, for form, for structure. Not because it's necessarily, I'm not saying something is better or worse, but it's something that is lacking in many respects in our lives. And it, uh, I think exactly what it was meant to achieve, that idea of finding balance as a human being, I think this repertoire, whether it's the music or whether it's the dancing or the, the straight theatre, I think it can still add those qualities to our lives. It can help us find emotional and uh, personal balance, whether it's as artists or as people who are simply attending the theatre. I just want to follow that, the trajectory from noble dancing to ballet to modern dancing. So if, as it goes into ballet, it is both upper class and middle class audience. Yes. Am I right? Yes. So they're incorporated into it. And when did the switch come from ballet to modern dance and why? That happened probably as a result of the Ballet Russe uh, in the early 20th century. Diaghilev's marvelous company from Russia, Nijinsky, Pavlova, they were bringing classics at the beginning and uh, bringing some Russian culture at the beginning, but as the company grew older for the 20 years that it existed, they were becoming more and more avant-garde and that became very in, as the modern movement was at that time in, in the 20th century in Europe. Uh, <coughs> Martha Graham picked up on that in, uh, in North America and they wanted to go against everything that ballet was. They took off their shoes, turned in their feet, rolled on the ground, broke the form, uh, and contemporary, it's called contemporary now. Modern dance is old fashioned now. Now it's contemporary dance. Uh, today is something extremely athletic, um, extremely um, rhythmic. It, they seem to never stop moving, almost a bit like hip hop in a way. Uh, so it, dance continues to evolve, but there, that, the, the audiences have divided a little bit, I think. Um, the ballet audience doesn't go to modern or contemporary and vice versa very much. I think because they, they see completely different things. They get completely different experiences from them. And our audience, I think, um, would be more people that wanted to see ballet. Right. Yeah. You know, also, the, the whole modern movement in terms of dance, you have to remember it, it's it, it doesn't develop in a vacuum. It's, it's growing, it's being affected and growing out of what is also happening in terms of music, what's happening in terms of the visual arts. Uh, it's sort of the chicken and the egg. Did Nijinsky create Rite of Spring? Uh, because that was something that, something that was a result of his own imagination? Or was it the fact that he had been exposed by Diaghilev to the music of Stravinsky? to a completely different musical system. And while he was listening to the music of Stravinsky, he was also looking at set designs and costume designs by Picasso and by Braque, uh, by Matisse. Uh, I mean, everyone sort of swimming around in the same sort of artistic soup at the time. And I, I, I don't think we can isolate just one, one area. And, and, am, I, and am I right to say that Romanticism by that time by Dijinsky's time, Romanticism had blown away the last oh, yes. vestiges long ago, of Baroque. Long ago. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, Europe or Western art was awash in the romantic yeah. sense of both poetry and both music and both movement and, and set design, all of that was a, an expression of uh, emotion above yes. all and not intellect and form. Emotion as opposed to an intellectual I I experience. But uh, you see, Robert, I would argue that we are still romantics. The romantic era is still playing out. It's not finished. Uh, the romantic, the romantic world that is obsessed with, on one hand, obsessed with feeling genuine emotional response, as opposed to having emotions described. But at the same time, ironically, the actors, the artists in the romantic world want to be feeling genuine emotions. The audience, however, in the romantic theatre is reduced to the role of a voyeur. It's sort of interesting, the, the two art forms, they've they almost have borrowed from each other. In the Baroque theatre, the audience is meant to participate. The actor is meant to describe. But when you go into the romantic world, the actor is participating. The audience is reduced to avo being a voyeur. Baroque, then, is to have the audience feel it, not a the Baroque performers actor feel it. 
describes what they want the audience to feel. That says everything about what that style of acting, and by acting I'm talking about singing actors, dancing actors, whatever, they're storytellers. It's an age of great descriptive narrative. It's not because they couldn't feel emotions, they weren't interested in feeling emotions. Or as David Mamet would say, any actor is going to feel something. We're not saying you must not have an emotional response if you're in Baroque theatre. Just emotion is not to be cultivated by the actor. It's a byproduct. It's something that may happen, but you're not going to dig for it. You're not going to cultivate it because that means your attention is starting to go on yourself rather than it going out to the people that you're playing to. The other problem, Robert, and I mean, I'm going to go on a tangent now, but the other big issue is that Baroque theater is full of huge, huge dialogues, huge arias in which people describe their emotions. They describe what they are feeling for the audience. Now that's a big problem if you start taking that type of theater and trying to apply 20th century or I'd say romantic acting techniques to it. You see, if actors are being trained to try to access and feel genuine emotion, and yet they're then given an enormous dialogue in which they're describing emotion, I would argue that the two can't happen at the same time. They've been written for different reasons. It's where, where it, it, it's hot and cold. If I see someone who's about to jump from a bridge, as the, as the person who is not a professional, I would scream, don't jump, and then they probably would. What does the professional do? That's the person who goes in and says, why do you want to jump? What are you doing? Why do you want to do this? Talk to us. Tell us why you're feeling what you're feeling. The moment someone starts to describe why they are so despondent that they want to take their own life, they can no longer inhabit that sense of, th they no longer have that anguish. You can't describe that anguish and feel that anguish. We talk about talking people out of a situation. So you're saying by describing the state, you actually become aware and set yourself a distance from that state and yes. therefore can start to escape. You can start acting. State. You can start or if you're taking it to the theatre, you can start acting. A child's having a tantrum. When I was a child, you were slapped if you were having a tantrum. Now, someone says, and it works. Why are, you, why are you unhappy? Why are you crying? Tell daddy why you're unhappy. What is it that's wrong? A child cannot describe a tantrum and have a tantrum. They don't happen together. If you can get them talking, the anger, the fury comes down. So how does this relate to Baroque acting then, which is describing the emotion, not living the emotion? They're describing the emotion so that you will feel the emotion. By describing the emotion, by staying out of it themselves, so that the audience, the audience is reduced simply to watching them, they're focusing on using a carefully developed text where emotion is being described rather than felt or shown. Ideally, through describing that, the audience is going to feel what they are describing rather than watching what they're feeling. I understand that and I have to then ask this question. Is that worked in the 18th century? Is that because the audiences understood that was the method to feel the audience? And is that not transferable to oh, no, it, our it, audience? It worked because of the writing style. It worked okay. because of what okay. was written. Right. You're not going to get such enormous descriptions of emotion as you move into 19th century opera and 19th century theater. You get huge emotional situations, you get gigantic emotional displays, but if you take the libretto for an 18th century opera, the libretto for a 19th century opera of the same length, the 18th century libretto is pages longer. It's about words, it's about descriptive narrative as opposed to extended emotional state.